we're going to have a panel. And this panel is, again, about OpenStreetMap and balancing structure with grassroots mapping. So can I invite the panelists to come up? So we have uh, Ewan Hill. And Carol Chan, can you please come up? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, give him a round of applause. <laughs> and we have Harry and Nico from HOT. And then Natasha should be somewhere in the room. Great. Thank you, Natasha. And I think we need an expert. you guys like to do it it's all good <laughs> so we're going to try to keep this interactive um, I've been to some panel sessions where we kind of get each panelist to give their own take on the answer and then by the time you get to the the end of the row everyone's asleep we're going to try to like bounce it around we have live polls which we're going to get to hopefully it's fun and you learn something um, but really the idea I think for this session is that OpenStreetMap is really interesting. It's, we've talked about it being super critical infrastructure. Um, we've seen organizations form around it. So we have um, you know, Harry and Miko with experience at humanitarian OpenStreetMap, which started around the Haiti earthquakes where they realized that there was a need for some sort of community and organization around humanitarian mapping. Um, that's an example of like creating an organization to solve a problem. But we also see the brilliance of OpenStreetMap of just being like really bottoms up, um, people, volunteers on the ground. Ewan's done a lot of mapping in Melbourne as one example, just in his own volunteer time, riding his bicycle around, collecting data. Um, so there's value to you know organizations getting involved, but also that top down, that, that bottoms up approach. So I wanna start off by, um, by looking at the question, which was, yeah, you guys can access Slido now. So uh, if you could scan that QR code. Um, you'll be able to start asking questions that we can load up later. Yeah, you don't need to worry about it just now, but uh, we'll get everyone looking at that. And then can we please switch to the other tab with the questions? No, there, there should be a PowerPoint loaded on the computer. There we go, thank you. We're in business. So the first question I'm asking the panel, do local OSM chapters benefit from governance? If so, how? If not, why not? Um, anyone is welcome to take it. doesn't have a local chapter, but yes, thank you. Okay, um, so a lot of those areas don't have a local chapter, but I can say that there are strong, diverse, emerging open street map communities in those areas, uh, specifically in the African and Asian portions. Like they don't have OSM chapters, um, but in some sort of way, there's a, a, a very informal type of governance that, that, that works there. So I, I do think that it's very important that these structures should be there to protect, especially to protect the members, to, to guide uh, community members. And uh, pretty much that's one reason how communities build up because there are these parameters or, or I don't wanna say boundaries, but there are these limits that protects each, each member and the people they are serving. Uh, the purpose of that community. And I think, no, just kidding. <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, 
Um, so I like structure, <laughs> um, but I know there's a lot of people actually don't like things done a certain way. Um, when you're talking about small communities, I think in terms of governance, it has to be a bit more um, hands-off. Uh, let the community focus on how they want to handle um, themselves. For OS and Fiji, we're informal. We're not legal. <laughs> um, but we're a local community uh, of mappers, and we don't really have any governing in, uh, structures in place right now. So it works, um, but I think like when you think about local knowledge and protecting indigenous uh, knowledge and also what we're mapping on the ground, then we definitely do need governing. Yes. Yeah, thank you. For me? I mean, I, I speak from the Indonesia RSM community perspective. So I think uh, for us in Indonesia, I think we kind of, you know, have some beneficials from the governance because at the end of the day, uh, this community uh, in Indonesia, it's really helpful to support uh, many, many activities in the open mapping. And they really, you know, sometimes when there is some more structures and, and support, on, and that's why we also decided to register legally the community back in 2015. So it's easy for us to be also acknowledged by the, by the governments, by, by the, all the structure that needs to be done because of the bureaucracy, things like that. So they they work. It's more acknowledgeable in the public eye, something like that. So I think that's the one of the benefit, and they get exposure on that, and they will get some potential opportunity, you know, in the future, for for those people who really co really really deep dive into commitment into the open mapping area in Indonesia. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. So working with government, obviously, they is generally a lot easier when you have formal structure. Um, we've heard from uh, obviously Carol talking about her perspective with OpenStreetMap Fiji, and we've heard about perspectives from Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, I want to switch to TomTom Tom now. TomTom's Tom's in a really interesting situation. This is obviously a leader in mapping technology for, for decades, and they made a huge bet this year committing to using OpenStreetMap. And so I think their perspective is very interesting on, um, on the level of government governance. I think one of the challenges that TomTom Tom has is when you're looking at OpenStreetMap data, as we mentioned earlier today, the way that roads are described is just one example, um, can be very different depending on what we're talking about. So TomTom Tom probably would have some perspectives on, on kind of the data structures and when governance is required there. Um, Natasha, I was wondering if you had any thoughts there. Yes, I think with the, the governance, it, it helps bring integrity and trust in using the data because one of our, most of our users are concerned about their privacy protection and that's what we try and provide back to them. So having that governance helps us ensure that we can have a quality on the data that we use um, and that we have also quality into the, the products that it will, the algorithms will work better. So it's definitely something that we are pro for and the governance into the OpenStreetMap. I think there's um, layers involved. So I think at a local community level, you don't need that governance. You you need that one or two identifiers there to actually explain the best approach. Uh, and then going up further, so there's lots of uh, talk channels. Discord in Australia is uh, pretty big to discuss uh, changes. We can see the change sets come in and people look at those actively to see whether they need to be reverted or changed uh, or you know, the user um, educated a little bit. And then we have a, a top layer of governance and I, I think that works pretty well. Um, you know, you look at uh, the Fitzroy River crossing, which uh, the bridge washed away, and uh, you know um, you can't get from Perth to Darwin for uh, until 2025 down, uh, through that route. You know, uh, how much governance do you need for that to actually remove the bridge and uh, then put it back uh, when it when it becomes a, a, a proper bridge again? Yeah, thanks, you and you and ads really interesting perspective, as I mentioned, um, being someone who's probably one of the most active people on the Australian mailing list. So often when there's a question about how to tag something, Ewan has um, a lot of expertise to share there. 
Um, we're going to, can we switch back to Slido now? Okay, we have some questions coming in, which is great. Um, and can we go to the, the first audience question, the first audience poll? Yeah. So I want to see how many people have actually made an edit in OpenStreetMap. If you could just scan the QR code and answer this first question. Is 50 the uh, total number of answers, or is that the people looking at the poll? Answers okay, that's a great, that's fine, it's very simple. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for voting. We get a sense of the audience. So we've got some people who've never edited, which is great. So uh, maybe by the end of this conference, that will be 100%. If you want to learn how to make a first edit, any of the people here are a good place to start. So looking at other OpenStreetMap communities, uh, sorry, other open data communities, I think is very interesting. We have uh, Wikipedia is one of the most successful, like incredibly well-funded, and yet you still get emails from them every week from our mate Jimmy asking for more money. Um, but, you know, incredibly successful. The Linux Foundation is incredibly successful and, and obviously very uh, well established to get getting funding from um, institutional uh, organizations as well as grassroots. You have OpenStreetMap US, which I think is probably one of the best examples of creating structure around OpenStreetMap recently and, and kind of getting full-time professional staff, but they're not really getting involved in the, in the technical discussions so much just yet. So. I wanted to put it to the panel now, um, starting from anywhere, about what lessons you think we can draw from other open data communities about what not to do maybe and what, what we could um, do better based on their practices. I'm going to share about <coughs> the, our lessons, especially for the QGIS community, because I think they, they, they found it earlier than the OSN community itself, also Linux. One of the lessons that it takes years to <laughs> to really uh, you know promote this kind of uh, new things such as OpenStreetMap, and because in Indonesia it's kind of really not really popular about the free and open source tools, because most people, especially in the university, right, uh, they they just introduce with the like the ArcGIS, for example. So so when when you share something like a free and open yeah, maybe they, they they interest at the beginning, but they always, you know, asking about the quality and quality and about the quality. How about the quality? How how this is really sustainable? Things like that. So, one thing that we learn from Indonesia is it takes some faith and takes years to promote. Uh, and it's better if we can collaborate together instead going by you know separately things like that. So that's why. With the QGIS community, OSM Indonesia community, it's like had some kind of collaborations in a very small level scale, but at least it's it's helping us to getting more attractions from the wider people, right? So is that with OSGEO or is that a separate? <laughs> it's like a OSGEO, but it's it's specifically to QG, QGIS subgroup. Right. Right. <coughs> Any other perspectives on other organizations, open data communities? Yeah, no worries, we can move on. So the last question from my side, um, now we get more into the tagging schema. So OpenStreetMap's tagging schema has been wonderful for data diversity and ease of contribution, but it makes data consumption more challenging um, just because of how diverse it is. Do you agree? And what solutions do you think could address this? And I deliberately did not share these questions with them previously because <laughs> I, I wanted their honest I wanted their honest responses, not the canned response that their employer might get them to provide. I, I would love to give you an honest response now. Please, right? please do. <laughs> um, look, you know, we we started off with mapping uh, buildings and roads uh, pretty basically, and uh, it's just increased and increased and increased. Uh, for people like TomTom, Tom, that might be a bit of a struggle, but uh, 
you know, if you know the data and if you've been in there and you use Overpass Turbo uh, more often than not, you'll you'll get the information that you need and you can manipulate it through an ETL process. It it, it shouldn't be too too problematic. And as time goes by, there's a lot of people who are in the community who uh, go through and refactor those tags. And I, I think you'll find that uh, the quality is very good in the city um, once you get out into the regions and uh, into uh, smaller communities, probably a little bit poorer. But uh, I, I see um, yeah, to mix something from Tanzania to New Zealand would be a, a, a difficult uh, mix, but how often do you do that? Just to speak into that, for those who might have any background in putting a map together for, for navigation, it does require a huge amount of specifications and um, th in, in this case tagging, but we would use an internal name differently. But using the tagging with OSM, we find it's easier to relate to. Um, it's, it's very helpful for us to use and it's one of the benefits that we've had to be able to produce a combined map for TomTom with, uh, within a year. So um, I think the tagging has been pretty good for us to easily use on our side. You wanna go first, Tari? Yeah. Okay, I, I think myself, no. Um, I think one important thing to look at about the question is that um, uh, there is the assumption that consumption is just going to focus on being used by the big transport companies, uh, the navigation uh, groups, and things like that. But um, we usually forget that consumption can also be uh, used at the community level. And especially, it's at that arena wherein the value of the data that OpenStreetMap is being uh, producing could actually be leveraged and, and be uh, and be able to feed grassroots decision making. So I think one important uh, consideration as OpenStreetMap contributors and also developers and people who use it is to ensure that the literacy, that the people that we are sharing this information uh, are able to absorb how we do the processes, are able to understand these tagging schema. It's usually is very complicated, but I do feel that uh, as contributors, developers, and, and users of these data, we should extend a little bit more patience with new co incoming uh, OSM contributors. We should extend uh, a bigger heart in letting them understand these tagging schemes. Because I myself, I went through this tagging scheme and it took me years before I, uh, oh, I need to combine these two tags to just say that there's a hospital which is concrete. So it's very, it's, it, it's, that's pretty simple. But for some people, it might take them months, years to understand it. So uh, I guess it's also a call to action. Uh, I guess that uh, we should also be mindful of how we present these tagging schema and, and to, to educate, uh, especially those uh, new contributors, new users, and new possible uh, people coming into the OpenStreetMap ecosystem. So just a uh, follow-up question there. One thing that I guess OpenStreetMap has done to make it easier for new people is um, in ID Editor, which is one of the web-based um, tools to edit OpenStreetMap, it's got presets. So if you're a New Zealander and you type in, uh, did you say petrol station here? Yep. Um, it, it would come up with a petrol station. In America, if you typed in, um, gas station, it would come up with the same, like the, the data is still the same on both sides, but it's converting it and making it regionally specific. Um, and there's many examples of that, uh, that the local community can edit and make it um, versatile. So do you think examples like that uh, are useful, like ID editor making some suggestions about how to tag something based upon what the user is writing? And that could be for you, Carol, as well, if you want to. You, you, wait, uh, before I pass it to Carol. Um, the, the tool is very useful, but I myself, knowing um, I experience in OpenStreetMap, don't know how to suggest it. So right. there's still that uh, information gap between these really useful tools and how it could be used by uh, more common community people uh, coming in. Yeah. 
think I'm just gonna reiterate Miko's point. <laughs> so for OSM Fiji, because it's a community, um, we found that there's not a lot of consumption of OSM data. Um, I guess Orisi will talk about Pick a Free Project and how they actually utilized OSM data and improved that by adding more attributes um, because again, it's context to where you're working, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's great to have diversity in terms of the tagging schema, but it can be overwhelming for smaller communities. Um, so far, we only know of one instance where OpenStreetMap data has been used in the local community in Lamy uh, for emergency training, uh, evacuation training. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so for us, the struggle really is awareness and training people how to utilize the data, but also consume it in a way that is, yeah, fits the context of what they're trying to use it for. Mm, uh, Indonesia's experience. So for us, uh, it's more about localize the context of tagging scheme itself. And we use uh, the OSM wiki because uh, there is a, like a OSM wiki called Map Features. <laughs> and if you visit that, there is a very long list of uh, features that you can map in OSM. And for us, we, we saw it as a very hard for the people who want to start contributing OSM. There is even like a skiing, like a place which is not really a relevant in Indonesia. <laughs> so we try to, you know, take some very relevant objects and we put new wiki that available in Bahasa Indonesia in the local language. And we also try to, uh, f you know, at the government reference, for example, the type of the roads, and we try to fit in with the international standard that already defined by OSM. But at the end of the day, you have to take a look at the reference from the government. So we put that context in our OSM wiki, mm -hmm. and so people, we share it, and people would be more easy to understand. Like uh, there is a tag like kiosk, for example, some people in other countries just call kiosk, but not not the case in Indonesia. We have to put the local name. Right. So people like, oh, this is actually kiosk. Because in OSM, you have to put the key and value in the tagging in English. But it doesn't really matter as long as people understand what's the local name. But if they don't understand the local name, it's kind of hard for them. So I think uh, localize the context and using OSM Wiki uh, for us in Indonesia, it's really helpful. And also preset, I was agree, but it's like uh, years ago. Now it's more easy for people to start contribute using ID editor. And it's kind of complex if you want to use presets. It's, it's uh, JOSM is more used, in Indonesia, JOSM is more used like uh, two years ago, but now people is like uh, changing to ID because the internet connections improve, you know, very progressing in Indonesia, people can access more internet better, things like that. So preset, it's I think, no longer relevant to helping this kind of context, but I think it's more like on wiki. So you just share the localized context of tagging scheme that you have in your country and people will be more understanding. So yeah, some very interesting debates actually around the presets. Um, if, if you want to dive into that, what you, how you describe a bubble tea shop in the German perspective versus the Taiwan, Taiwanese perspective, that's uh, on the wiki. So we're gonna go back to Slido now. Um, if we could just jump back to the questions. Okay, great. We have some really good questions there, which we will get to. Let's do the second poll. This is open-ended. We'd love to create a word cloud. Um, you can think about this and we might leave it up. But while this is... Uh, Do we need do we need more answer on that one? Or? Sorry. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the number one upvoted question: Are there places that urgently need help in mapping, and are there strategies to support them? So maybe, um, yeah. I d did you hear that one? <laughs> Are there places that need support, um, that urgently need mapping, and are there strategies that we can do to support them? Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with this answer re regarding the, the funding itself, because 
you know, uh, like OSM Foundation say, it's, it's free and open to use, but not free to maintain. It's pretty similar in the OSM project itself. We always seeing like, uh, you know, money is the tools, but how we can effectively use the tools itself. So it's not just about the funding, I think. It's more like a using those funding and created more like a, a very strategic uh, work plan in the OSM project so it can make sure the sustainability. So it, it, it because in my experience, there, there were some kind of project that because we think we have money and we think, hey, let's map somewhere. But it's just stopped after the project ended. Right. There is no more continuations. Mm -hmm. And we kind of not really want to replicate those kind of approach. So that's why at the moment in Open Mapping Hub, <coughs> we learn from our national experience that, you know, that would be better if we not, we also starting to avoiding the assumptions that we know everything. We, we have to start that whenever we approach the community, we also have to think they know something or maybe they know even better than us. They just don't know the tools, how to use that or how to map that. So I think th from that perspective that we can really, you know, uh, see the possibility how the best way to use these tools, how the best way to integrate them in the OSM project and hopefully that will be make more sustainable for them and for, for the wider people, right? Um, if you're looking at uh, where to map urgently, um, I would certainly suggest Hot OSM, and you can see all the tasks there that uh, come out. You know, with it might be something different ne next week to the week after. You know, the, it's a really changing and challenging world nowadays. Um, the validation on there. So, if you're a really good uh, OSM editor, uh, a lot of these projects need a whole lot of validation. And so it would be really good to go through and as a validator, validate these and uh, give assistance to the ones who may have not got it co absolutely correct the first time. Give them a bit of a uh, push uh, along and you'll actually get a better editor along the way. Yeah, keeping people engaged after those first few edits is always hard. Um, yeah, just quickly and then we'll, we'll address the, the word cloud. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that's correct. Thank you for answering the question. So Hot OSM uh, actually uh, gives you a highlight of where uh, mapping is needed. So usually these places don't have uh, road building data. In some cases, um, you could collaborate with us the, at, at Hot or the Open Mapping Hub. So if there's also a need in the community where priority needs that uh, this area needs to be mapped, updated data needs to be there, um, we could totally support and help you in setting things up. Like for example, in the Afghanistan earthquake, instead of mapping the uh, intensity five uh, radius of the earthquake, we got mappers to just look at their phones and identify whether there are settlements there. So, uh, so these uh, tools are able to actually trim down uh, mapping uh, by 60%, 70%. So uh, we're really interested for you to try it out on Friday uh, and we'll share those tools so that you could uh, play and we could get that 100% later on. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, Ed, if I can just add, I'll be quick. I think where funding is really needed is on the OSM tools themselves. Uh, we've hosted quite a few mapathons and we, we're bringing editors together, but we find the performance of it, especially when multiple people are coming up the same IP, um, is really an issue. Um, and so if, if we are bringing more editors to map important areas, the t having the tools function very well would be really helpful. Um, that we found, um, especially with the hot OSM, has been one of the, the best tools out there to use in that regard. Um, so Yeah, hot OSM, DevSeed is here as well. They've been building some fantastic tools, um, having map bots around OSM char. Uh, but yeah, much more to do. So. <laughs> Just admiring this word cloud. Um, does anyone who's put anything now, I mean, funding, awareness, uh, Esri, the Zuck, uh, continuity, inconsistency, does anyone want to speak to the w their addition here? We have roving mics that we can bring around. No, that's okay. No, no comments here. Going once. 
going twice. Sold. Okay. Next one. Can we go to the next uh, next question? Sorry, back to Slido, the, the next question on Slido. All right, so we're going to keep this active poll going, and we're going to go to the next audience question. Um, how will the Overture Maps Foundation impact OpenStreetMap? And Natasha, maybe we'll start with you, uh, given your company is in the foundation. We, we're hoping, obviously, in a very positive way. Um, it's still early, early stages for us. But um, what we found is working collaboratively, we could achieve a lot more than uh, what we've been doing on our own. So yeah, let's wait and see in that space. Carol, any perspectives on Overture from, has Phoebe had a chance to look at the data? No? <laughs> it's all right. Ewan, do you know if the Victorian community has had a look? I think that, <laughs> I actually haven't seen the data yet, but um, consulting with communities, especially um, in Southeast Asia, uh, I think more OpenStreetMap communities, open mapping communities are in the process of really analyzing the data. Um, I, I'm sure there are confidence levels there, but uh, like I think w it's one thing that uh, community people or the OSM people from the ground are doing is to making sure that is this confidence level really confident with. So. Yeah, as far as I know, I think if there are uh, points of interest that are already there available uh, and, and people are able to validate whether the accuracy is really good enough, I, I think this would actually contribute better to uh, the OSM ecosystem. Yeah. yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think that's something that um, has been discussed is how to get more signal from, from the worldwide community about when something is accurate in Overture data, particularly around places, like places, I think they say 30% of places data changes like on a good year and then obviously over the last few years it was changing even quicker. So you really need people on the ground to confirm places data as one example. Um, any other thoughts on Overture or we'll go to the next question? All right, jumping to the third one. Is there any governance around protecting sensitive cultural data and if so, what can that information um, where can that information be found? I'm going to go to you, Ewan, first. I know we held a mapathon that um, dealing with indigenous place names that had a challenge around this. So I was wondering if you wanted to speak to uh, the sensitive data and how to manage data practices there. Um, so most of the countries have their own personal um, uh, wiki, uh, which is probably the first place to start looking at about what you should map and what you shouldn't map. Uh, we have both culturally sensitive and we also have natural attributes that may not want to be mapped. So um, tracks here that are being reclaimed by the national parks um, is a contentious issue there. And there's you know, ways of uh, Australia's gone through a process of saying this is the way you should tag a, a track that uh, exists on the ground but does, uh, shouldn't be used. Um, for Indigenous, I've, I've had a big change since the um, Indigenous Mapping Workshop and uh, you know, uh, data really needs to be protected and supported by the, the uh, local uh, tribes and I really want to see um, the ability for OSM to coexist but really have that data sovereignty uh, with with the people who uh, belong to. And I, I, I find that really important. Where, where to find that? No, that's a little bit difficult at the moment. And where where do you stretch your border lines? Do you, do you show a uh, scar tree because everyone knows about it? Or do you, um, you know, remove that scar tree from, um, from OSM? It's a difficult, difficult context. perspectives on uh, sensitive data? Yeah, actually my experience, use, uh, it's not more on indi indigenous data, but uh, in the Philippines I used to map LGBT safe spaces and try to put it in open street map. And then especially ex uh, exposing these spaces may be very da dangerous, especially uh, to the community. Um, 
OSM wise, I think like I'm in that perspective that these spaces are actually out. The information is actually available in, uh, in the internet. You just put LGBT safe space and it pops up. Everything's there already. Uh, even the street name, the number, everything. So it's it's uh, so. But I came into with the especially voicing, uh, especially those talks with community members need to happen. Uh, it shouldn't just be. Uh, discussions within the open street map communities, but it's very important that you also have these discussions with your um, with the communities that will be uh, affected by this data. Uh, so I conducted those consultations, and definitely some spaces need to cut to be cut out uh, on that. And I gave them that uh, sovereignty and that decision making uh, to choose which ones, because definitely some LGBT spaces are not really. We can't put them like there are um, uh, shelters that they don't want to put it on the map and things like that. But there are bars that they want to put it on the map because it, it's business. It it helps them to. So there should always that be that balance and uh, especially consent is very important. They should have a say in in those kinds of data and information. Similarly, when it comes to um, to uh, the, the topic of structure, like working with hot uh, humanitarian open street map team, we do conduct uh, risk analysis, and it's very important that, especially in the case of Afghanistan right now, it's very important that uh, community people, like we should, like though they are not representing the whole Afghanistan community there, but we, it, it gives us a sense check whether to move or not move, because uh, similarly, these organizations need map data uh, to supply re resources to those affected areas and things like that and 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 still each step of the way um we need to be very cautious and uh, also to bring in like like uh, the speech that was mentioned a while the more people you involve in that uh though it's going to be a very long road and very lengthy road uh it gives you back up to and and makes and gives you time to understand the situations before you do something that might be able that that might be irreparable damage to them uh, we're going to go to the audience now um, for this question how do you convince upper management to pay attention or to trust OSM data anyone can edit so we can't trust it does anyone in the audience have a perspective has anyone in the audience even better um, convinced their organization to use OpenStreetMap data. Yes, Lynn. Um, can we get a microphone up the back there for me? Well, yes, it's true. But uh, you have some crazy tools to check the, the contribution the this has been made. So. You can plug change, check if it's okay or not. And so there is no problem. There is just solution. So wha what are the, some of the tools that you use? Yeah. Wha um, what are some of the tools that you use? Uh, I don't remember the name, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but it was, um, um, sorry, I will find it again. But uh, yeah, it's a tool when, when you can uh, do some filters and some um <coughs> kind of edits and uh, you can uh, put some people on the um, blacklist, like some oh, people. Is, is that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, this yeah. one, she yeah, said that and it's, yeah, I never remember the name of this one. So yeah, this is a real good one. So you can uh, save some, um <coughs> sorry, some Awewa, Awea, sorry, you want to follow up and get some, well, <coughs> I've got some, I have got some, uh, uh, S S um, stuff. So when there is some edits on my area, I get an email, and so this is a really good tool. Yeah, uh, I, I love that you're policing your local area, and that's one of the great things about OpenStreetMap is people that pay attention. They know their area really well, and they make sure that any changes being made are are reflective of the local um, situation on the ground. Alex. I've got a, just a really quick an anecdote that I saw a presentation at Locate Conference in Australia, and there was a representative of the Victorian Department of Transport, and he compared the authoritative data set for road names or road centre lines, and it hadn't been updated for a long time. It was accurate for, for road names, mm. but 
compared to OpenStreetMap with lanes and directions and tram lines and bicycle lanes and footpaths and all of the extra information. He said it was night and day. And so he recognised that this data was really valuable. But he went the next step and worked out that um, you know, the process for them to feed directions into OpenStreetMap and to bring it back. And he was talking about how to engage with the OpenStreetMap community as well as a representative of the gov government and recognising that they were not necessarily like the, the giant ivory tower of excellence, you know. So it was a really great example of a, um, a government agency really engaging in the right way with OSM data set and community. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I love analogies like that. And I think maybe it shows that if sometimes you just put the data side by side and that that's one of the most convincing arguments. I mean, if, you're, if your employer is <laughs> a reasonable place and you show them that the data is like categorically better, that there's data in OSM that's not in the other database, then hopefully that's a convincing argument. Um, does anyone else have anecdotes like that? We've got a hand up the back. I didn't personally convince anybody to use OpenStreetMap, but um, so I work for Te Manatu Waka, which is Ministry of Transport here in New Zealand, and we are building a national transport model that actually uses OpenStreetMap. And one of the reasons for using that is the paid for version is very, very expensive. Um, and the, the, but the main reason was, other than cost, was we can share this model with other entities in the country. So whilst we'll be using it nationally, there can be, you know, it can be sent off to a regional council that wants to use the same, same tool for a, you know, a bounded um, simulation of their sort of transport infrastructure and networks. So, and what was really powerful was the way that we could collaborate with academic researchers who were doing extensive work with OpenStreetMap, both um, preparing pipelines with open source tools to process it and actually build, for example, multimodal networks. So you know where. You've got cycle lanes, pedestrian walkways, cars, buses, everything on just one sort of um, transport infrastructure um, uh, data set, but also that they were validating and they were able to sort of make edits where they needed to. So there were some examples with the cycle and Gabriel where they were able to make changes um, that they needed to then consume for analysis. So. So yeah, they just wanted to also let people know that New Zealand government is using tools like this, but um, possibly not, most people aren't aware of it because they happen as internal projects that don't really get publicized until way, way later when you know, something is ready to kind of um, showcase, um, you know. Yeah, thank you. That, that's really positive because it, it shows that um, they'll probably benefit from a, a conference like this maybe next year if we have it again, like to be able to go and share what they've what they've been able to do on top of OSM data, but I hear that time and time again, like particularly around researchers, the ability to go in, edit the data, add a cycleway. Like if you're trying to do multimodal routing, the ability to go in and add the bicycle lane that might not be in a proprietary data set is is very helpful. Um, uh, one of the things Ed is that um, for people in government, um, you probably have an open data policy of trying to push as much open data out. Uh, to the public, and I'd really encourage you to push that um, if you're in government. You know, every data set that uh, is de-identified should really be out there uh, and to assist everyone, and that will also encourage the use of uh, other other products. And you know, please, please do. Um, not so much for OpenStreetMap, but I have had success with. Um, arguing for other open source data tools before. I generally find that the cost argument doesn't work very well, um, uh, but uh, making arguments like the data quality, I've had a lot of success with that and actually arguing for the open source stuff and convincing them to complete um, the open version of the actual product. Um, I've also s uh, had a lot of success in saying, well, if you do get open source data or open source tools, you're going to have to find people who can actually work with it and uh, you are more likely to get that same better quality of uh, uh, candidates to provide the job if you can actually do it. That's but an interesting it's argument. Not <laughs> I like that one. Okay, I haven't heard that before. Um, so I think it's particularly with government. I can imagine there'd be some hesitancy around, and it varies by governments around the world, but some governments hate being open because it creates scrutiny and gets the annoying public asking questions. Um, are there any perspectives on, on 
know, if the government moves to OpenStreetMap, the responsibilities of the government to then contribute back to OpenStreetMap, make sure they're editing in the right way. Um, does the panel or the audience have any perspectives on that, whether it's a transportation agency or a land management agency? the kind of public responsibility of a government agency that might be moving to OpenStreetMap? I, I, I have uh, some experience examples in Indonesia. So if you're talking about the government, there is a lot of institutions, right? There is a, uh, I think from my experience, it depends on, on, on the what's the purpose of using OSM itself for them. For example, uh, for the National Disaster Management Agency and Local Disaster Management Agency, because they do have some kind of uh, focus or priority in the preparedness, for example. Obviously, OSM, it's one of the uh, logical options for them. And so it's, it's relatively easy to, you know, uh, convince them to really using OSM. It's also, there is some government in Indonesia, for example, like land institutions, I think. So they use OSM because uh, I think they do not really, they use the map, OSM as a base map, and they overlay with the price of the land itself, but only in the cities that have been mapped relatively well. Right. So meaning that they use the base map, but it seems like they don't have an intention to contribute on the map. Mm. Uh, so it's it's a different with the local uh, national disaster management agency because they know they have to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> map those disaster prone areas. It's they also push those uh, resources that they have to to collect the data into OSM to contribute. But in the land institutions, for example, they really like OSM, but if you're talking about giving back to the maps, maybe not. It meaning that it they will, you know, spend more money or something like that. Uh, if there is someone or some organizations want to do it fr free from them, they will happy to right. use the map. So that's the example that we have. So I think in, in, in Indonesia, one of the hesitants uh, outside the quality of the OSM that, you know, some people think pretty bad, I mean, it's also, it's sometimes open mapping like OSM, it's blocked them to, you know, potentially earn more money from some kind of big project. Because sometimes they open the project to the outsiders, like a tender, things like that. So yeah, I think that's also one of the reason why they not really fan of OSM. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists and the very um, comedic and creative uh, responses to the challenges and opportunities for OpenStreetMap. So thank you, Ewan, Natasha, Harry, Carol, and Nico. Um, you can find them around the conference the next few days if you have any questions on OpenStreetMap. Um, and hopefully we can continue this conversation at Pospergy State of the Map, Oceania 2023. Thank you. everyone. Uh, my name's Emma. We are going